middle school, the week that I decided to attend was music camp. And we got to take our instruments and play in a band. And we learned how to play the handbells. And we sang together as a choir. But we also did all the normal camp activities. We swam and canoed and played messy games. We did Bible study and worshiped. But one of my favorite things that we did every year was to play sardines. Does anybody, raise your hand if you've ever played sardines. OK, a fair amount. So for those of you who have never had the joy and honor of playing sardines, it's kind of like hide and go seek, but backwards. One person hides, and then the rest of the people seek them. And once you find them, you have to hide with them. So you can imagine 24 middle schoolers, the more people that found the original person, the louder it got, right? That's pretty much how sardines work, so that pretty soon you find them just by the noise they're making, because it's impossible to remain quiet in a hiding place with 20 kids. When we played it um, in the building we were in, we played um, sardines in the dark. So our counselors would turn off all of the lights in the building, and we weren't allowed to use flashlights, and we would have to go around in the dark trying to find the person who was hiding, which made it a little bit more challenging, but also made it even that much more awesome. And I remember like having to crawl under the beds in the really dark rooms to see if somebody was hiding there, because that really was the best hiding place. Of course, you can't fit 20 middle schoolers underneath the bed, so then it became you had to figure out where to hide in the room other than under the bed. But I remember having to figure out, uh, you know, you'd spend, we knew, I went three years to music camp. So by the second year, I knew that we were going to play sardines. So I spent the whole first part of the week trying to memorize where everything was in the building so that once the lights went out, I knew where I was going and wouldn't trip over things. It was awesome. I loved it. And then when I was in college, I began working at the camp. And uh, the people who worked at the camp stayed on campus, and our cabins were way in the back down this um, long dirt road in the very back against the, uh, against the river. And there were often times when I would be out with campers till 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night and would have to go walk back down that road back to my cabin by myself. And I'll never forget this one night, I accidentally forgot my flashlight, but I didn't figure it out until I was at the beginning of the road. And it was, y'all, it was a really long walk back to where the flashlight was. So I decided that it was fine, that I would just walk this wooded road in pitch black dark by the water by myself. It was a really smart decision. It was a very long walk back to my cabin, and I never, ever forgot my flashlight again. We have come to December 20th. Boy, time flies, doesn't it? I don't know how it's happened, but we're in the fourth week of Advent. Our Advent characters are getting closer and closer to the altar as we have journeyed together. Incidentally, I have lost three ducky wise men that look like those ducks. If you're in your pews later and see them, can you bring them to me? The kids hid them so well. No, those are the, that's the cow and the donkey. I'm missing the wise men. The kids hid them so well four weeks ago that I've not found them, so if you find them. But they're getting closer and closer. Maybe the wise men will show up or maybe they won't. We are five days before Christmas. Over the past four weeks, we've been learning about Jesus' birth and just what it is we're going to be celebrating in those five days, what it is we've been waiting for so patiently during the season of Advent. We've journeyed together through the four Gospels and seen how each of them tells the story just a little bit differently. Over the course of those weeks, I hope that joy has been restored to you in some way. Maybe as you've slowed down just a little bit, like the Gospel of Mark asked us to do in week one, or maybe as you've learned to see that God is present with you even in your suffering, as Matthew taught us, or maybe you've seen joy through the songs of Scripture, as Luke reminded us last week. This week, in the fourth Sunday of Advent, we turn to the Gospel of John. There are very few passages of scripture, I think, that can rival the opening prologue to the Gospel of John. It is a favorite of many for a reason. Right off the bat, just the way it's written tells us that John's Gospel is going to be a little bit different from the other three. We call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic Gospels because they share sources, right? Matthew and Luke use Mark as a source, and then Matthew and Mark also use another source in common. And they were also all written relatively close together. John, though, was the latest Gospel written, and it is vastly different from the other three. 
Do you remember that game um, that used to play on Sesame Street and they would sing that some one of these things is not like the other? I can't sing the tune for you, but I used to love that game. And if you played that game with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John would be the one that is not like the other three. So let me give you an idea of the differences. Mark was written about 70, and John was not written until 90. In the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus teaches mostly in short sayings and in parables. But in John, we find these really long monologues of Jesus, like three chapter long monologues of just Jesus speaking. John has a miracle, the turning of water into wine, that none of the other Gospels have. John is much more figurative and poetic in his language usage than the other two. And even the Greek words that he, use, that he uses are very, very different from the Greek that you see in the other three Gospels. So it's no surprise to us then that John's telling of the story of Jesus' birth begins quite differently. He begins with a prelude that is really more like a theological treatise on the divinity versus humanity of Christ than it is a narrative telling of Jesus' birth. There are no shepherds, there are no wise men, there's none of that. John wants us to understand right from the beginning just who Jesus is. So he writes the beginning in a way that is meant to spark the imagination, to capture the audience's attention almost like a preview for a movie would. Can you think of a movie that you still remember the preview for? The one that I remember is the preview for Jurassic Park. Do you remember that when it came out, oh, so many years ago? It had that glass of water and you could see the trembling from the dinosaurs walking, right? That's kind of like what the beginning of the Gospel of John is. It's a preview for what the whole rest of the Gospel is gonna be about. There's a certain kind of movement to what he does here that helps us to understand what he's getting out, what he wants us to know. So you can think of it kind of in terms of concentric circles, okay? He begins in the first three verses with the widest circle, telling us that the word made flesh, the word being Jesus, existed from the beginning of creation and is part of the creator. And then we zoom in just a little bit to the next circle, and John tells us that the word is the source of all light who vanquishes darkness. And then we go in just a little bit more, and he tells us that the word rules the earth and all its inhabitants. And finally, in the tightest, most specific circle, John tells us that the word is expressed in singular, finite form in Jesus. The word became flesh. It's from John's prologue that we begin to understand, as much as you can understand it, because it's really theologically complicated, the idea of the Trinity, right? How Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Creator are both one person and three persons. We begin to connect Jesus the Christ with Jesus the person that the other Gospels tell us about. John also wants us to connect this story, the story of Jesus' birth, with the story from the beginning of Scripture that Molly read for us, the story of creation, which also has this same kind of circular movement. The creation story starts with the widest circle, telling us that God, the creator, existed from the beginning and is the creator of all that is. And then God, who is the source of all light, separates light from darkness. And then we see that the same God who created rules over the earth and all its inhabitants. And then in the tightest, most finite circle, we are told that God created humankind in God's image. It's the exact same movement that we see in the Gospel of John. John wants us to connect this Christ child that will be born with the God who created the whole universe. John also wants us to connect the Christ child with the other awesome thing that God created, us, humanity. So he's saying to us that Christ is both divine, part of God, and human. He is God made flesh. He's saying that what happened in the beginning was the start of a new creation and a divine image in human form. And what happens in Jesus' birth is a new creation and a new divine image in human form. As we read further into the Gospel of John, it is possible to see quite clearly one of the main themes that he uses, light versus darkness. John uses it over and over and over, making it quite clear that this is one of the central facets he wants us to know about Jesus. He is the light in the midst of a dark world, a light that darkness cannot overcome. 
We see it in John chapter 3 when Nicodemus comes to Jesus under the cover of darkness. And Jesus describes those who live in the truth as ones who come to the light. And then in chapter 8 when Jesus is teaching in the temple and he calls himself the light of the world. Right after that, Jesus heals a blind man, transforming his world from one of darkness to one of light. And then later in chapter 11, when Jesus raises Lazarus from his death and from the darkness of a tomb, Jesus challenges the disciples who are standing around to walk in the light of the day in order to prevent stumbling in the night. And then in chapter 12, when Jesus enters Jerusalem to begin his final week of life, he urges the disciples to believe in the light so that their lives might be determined by the light. Now we could begin to get caught up in the theological prowess of John and begin to scratch our heads trying to figure all of it out. We could spend a lot of time asking this morning, how does all of that happen? How is Jesus with God in the beginning and also the word made flesh? But instead, John wants us to ask another question. He wants us to ask why. And the answer is this. God touched the earth in the form of Jesus to save us from the suffering caused by our own sin, by suffering with us. Let me repeat that again. God touched the earth in the form of Jesus to save us from the suffering caused by our own sin, by suffering with us. As I told you last week, I think it's important to note that Jesus was not born into the most wonderful time of the year. He wasn't born into a place filled with holiday cheer, with festive decorations and smiles on everyone's faces and general goodwill. No, he entered a world filled with chaos and fear, a world where his family and their people were oppressed citizens, a world where there was a paranoid, murderous king who wanted to kill him and uh, infants around him, a world of inhospitable people who left no room for his parents, a world of suffering and fear, of hatred and prejudice. Does that sound at all familiar? That's the world Jesus comes into. He entered the world just as it is and lived in the world just as it is. During his lifetime, he would endure the heartbreak of a loved one's death, the sting of a close friend's betrayal, the fatigue of ministering to the world's least and lost, the vengeful backlash that comes from speaking truth to power, the pain of physical torture and his own death. It certainly wasn't the most wonderful time of the year. And yet, the light came into the world and even death could not vanquish it. And here's the truth that John wants us to know right from the beginning. God has come here to be with us. God has come here to be with you. He comes not in spite of your suffering, but to share in your suffering. Not in spite of your darkness, but because of our darkness. He comes so that we can see a great light. In her book, Learning to Walk in the Dark, one of my favorite preachers, pastor, theologian, and author, uh, Reverend Dr. Barbara Brown Taylor, writes about a blind French resistance fighter named Jacques Lucirin. Lucirin wasn't born blind, but uh, he didn't have the greatest vision, but he wasn't born blind, and he had to start wearing glasses very young. And during a little scuffle, like most boys get into at school age, he fell into the corner of his teacher's desk, and the arm of his glasses drove deep into his right eye, and another part of his frame tore the retina in his left. And so at the age of seven, he was left completely and irreparably blind. His doctor suggested sending him to a residential school for the blind, but his parents wouldn't let them do it. They wanted him to stay in the public school system where he could learn to function in a seeing world. So he and his mother learned Braille together. They outfitted his desk. The school put a bigger desk in for all of his Braille equipment. And they took an important attitude, which is that they decided they would never pity him. Instead, they taught him that he was not a poor blind boy, but the discoverer of new worlds. Isn't that an amazing attitude to take? His father, who was a deeply spiritual man, told him, always tell us when you discover something new. So he did. He eventually wrote a memoir called And There Was Light, and in it he tells perhaps the most important discovery he had, which happened about 10 days after his accident, that affected how he saw himself for the rest of his life. This is what he said. I had completely lost the sight of my eyes. I could not see the light of the world anymore, yet the light was still there. 
its source was not obliterated. I felt it gushing forth every moment and brimming over. I felt how it wanted to spread out over the world. I had only to receive it. It was unavoidably there. It was all there, and I found again its movement and shades, that is, its colors, which I had loved so passionately just a few weeks before. This was something entirely new. You understand all the more, so since it contradicted everything that those who have eyes believe, the source of light is not in the outer world. We believe that it is only because of a common delusion. The light dwells where life also dwells, within ourselves. In January 1944, Lucirin was captured by the Nazis and shipped off to a work camp. And one of his greatest discoveries was how the light he saw changed with his inner condition. So when he was sad and afraid, he found that the light within decreased at once. There were times, he said, when it went out altogether, leaving him deeply and truly blind. When he was joyful and attentive, he found that it returned strong as ever. Very quickly, he learned that the best way to see the inner light and remain in its presence was to love. He was able to put this into practice while in the work camp. And this is what um, Reverend Barbara Brown Taylor said about it. When he let himself become consumed with anger, he started running into things, slamming into walls and tripping over furniture. When he called himself back to attention, the space both inside and outside of him opened up so that he found his way and moved with ease again. The most valuable thing he learned was that no one could turn out the light inside of him without his consent. Even when he lost track of it for a while, he knew where he could find it again. One of my favorite traditions, one that we didn't do every year, but we did some years, was driving around whatever town we lived in to look at the Christmas lights. My girls have been pointing out the really colorful ones as we've been driving around running errands and doing things the past few weeks. There are some who call this season the season of light. But let's think about those lights for a moment and what they represent. We light them because they're pretty because they make our trees look good, and because our neighbors are doing it. But they also serve a purpose, right? They burn brightly and pierce through the darkness of a cold, cold winter. Well, not a cold winter this year, but normally a cold, cold winter. Friends, there are times when the world gets a little bit dimmer for all of us, times when the things going on around us or inside of our own brains and hearts obstruct our view of the light. But John tells us, that it's always there, always shining in the dark, that nothing can overcome it. Pastor Bill taught me a trick this week. Can you, I want you to come up and do it because I can't use that lighter. Surprise! <laughs> so he's going to show you a little trick. And, you, I, we, you know, there's no way for me to, um, to put it up on the screen. So you're just going to have to pay attention. Why don't you maybe do it with this one right here because that's the sure. closest one. So he's going to blow out the candle, and watch what happens when he, re when he goes to relight it. He's not touching the wick at all, if you can't see it in the back. So once you blow it out, if you go to relight it, it just has to get close to the other light, and it jumps into where it was right before. Thank you. Let's give Pastor Bill a round of applause. When the light goes out, if it's next to another light, close enough, it catches again. And that's what we're called to do. Christ is the true light that comes into the world, the one that sets all of us aflame. But we are called to be lights for the world to one another. God asks us to do that because he knows that there will be times when we can't see the light, when we can't see the true light. But we are tasked with pointing one another back to the light, with helping our brothers and sisters who find themselves in a time of darkness to catch the light again. And we do that not with trite and cliche sayings, not telling people to try harder or be better. We do it as Lucerin learned to do, by loving. That's how we stay close to the light. We pay attention and we love. May your light so shine in the darkness that all of those around it can see through the darkness just a little bit more. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.